My name is Matthew Vashore and today I'm going to read from the scripture Proverbs chapter 22 starting from verse 20 Have not I written to thee excellent things and counsels and knowledge that I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send unto thee Now we are looking today at an area called archaic words I'm from the Bible Protector Ministry and we are going to review a video by Mark Ward in which he talks about a book by Lawrence M. Vance on the topic of archaic words. We're going to play a bit of his video and as we go through the video we're going to make some answers of uh, the accusations or underlying incorrect and subtle attacks that Mark Ward makes in this effeminate review of this whole area about archaic words. Let's begin to look at a little bit of the video that he made. Gloriously wrong, infamously wrong, precisely at the point of its central thesis. When it came time to rate this book on Goodreads, I wanted to give it one star out of five. Okay, so why is he saying that Lawrence M. Vance's book is wrong? I'm not here to defend that book, but why is he saying it's wrong? Because what he would do and could do is go to the Oxford English Dictionary, the full Oxford English Dictionary, and in there it'll say whether a word is archaic or not. And he'll then point out and say, well, Lawrence M. Vance, uh, he has incorrectly defined what an archaic word is or isn't because here's the Oxford English Dictionary and uh, here, here it's saying that this word is or, or that word is there and what we find really with this is that it's not really a um, a proper way of appraising or looking at the King James Bible but is a method of trying to undermine those who love the King James Bible while claiming that you love the King James Bible yourself so what we're going to do is we're going to find um, some quite basic biblical answers biblically based or or arguments that can be said counter to what Mark Ward is arguing from a biblical perspective, from a, from a basis of proper understanding of biblical doctrine. But I couldn't. I had to give Vance another third of a star for sheer gumption, another third for the thousands of hours of work that he did put into this thick book, and a last third of a star for being the only person in the King James Only world that I have personally run into who demonstrated knowledge of the existence of the Oxford English Dictionary. So, Well, that's a bit silly, isn't it? I mean, how true is it? How many people would really know that the Oxford English Dictionary exists? And I would say that, unlike what Mark Ward here is subtly trying to do in undermine and make out as if if you hold the King James Bible as perfect you must be some sort of anti-intellectual of course we know the Oxford English Dictionary exists and of course we understand its place and purpose let's articulate a few of those points really quickly the Oxford English Dictionary in a book by Berg called a user's guide to the Oxford English Dictionary it particularly says that the Oxford English Dictionary first of all it's not proscriptive it's not in itself a final authority secondly he points out and says that as long as there's people to use words then they're not archaic or or not obsolete as long as people keep them in in usage in that there's someone that acknowledges what they mean these are very important points that address and answer really all of this mockery that mark ward is putting up against the king james bible and really undermines this whole area that which we'll find that the Oxford English Dictionary somehow is supposedly the authority. It's a authentic record of historical usage of English words. It's not in itself a final authority of truth. It was made by men. You know, Mark Ward is one of these people who no doubt has accepted some of these enlightenment little bits of thinking in his Christianity, in his Christian theology, and that's what we call modernism, but with a lower case M. And in doing so, he would say that, you know, no one's perfect, and 
we can't know the truth and things like that. But suddenly when it comes to this, he's gloatingly putting forth that, oh, well, the Oxford English Dictionary, that's a standard of, you know, whether a word's archaic or not. And uh, somehow that's a standard for how we're going to decide or know about uh, words and their meaning and so forth in English we're talking. But uh, th this is actually fallacious. It's, it's not actually a correct approach. Whilst it's factually um, something that you can use as a tool and, and is, is good, the ultimate truth is scripture itself, is the King James Bible itself. That the King James Bible is in itself the, the, the basis for the authority of the definition of truth. I know that James White and people like that, they'll say, oh, but that's a circular argument. You're saying that if it's in the King James Bible, it must be absolute true and uh, without reference to outside authority. And in that sense, yes, because truth has to be self-consistent, just as how, how do you say, you know, God is God, except that God is God. It's a circular argument in that sense, but it's not a fallacious argument. And circularity in this sense is good. Um, so that's the same with the King James Bible. Because it is right, uh, therefore, uh, whatever it has is correct. And when you examine that, and even if you examine that in 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 a way that you, you're not being skeptical in the sense of doubting, but you look at that and you analyze that, uh, you'll find that in fact there's a great witness, a great consistency there within the King James Bible itself pointing at itself. The King James Bible is in a form of language called Biblical English. This Biblical English is not identical to Elizabethan English, but is an English that is based on God's raising up of English through history to be a vehicle for conveying to the world the truth, uh, to the to the world the very accuracy of Scripture, the very knowledge of what words mean or what the message of Scripture is. And so we find that English being a global language today, that's a providential thing. And here we have the best Bible version, the best translation, the best Bible, and in fact the perfect one, and that's conveying the truth for people today. It's comprehensible to people today. And as I mentioned before, uh, as long as there's someone alive that knows what a word means, then it's not gone. You see, Mark Word Ward is really going to be, uh, well, he's, he, he's obviously trying to make out as if the King James Bible doesn't speak or is incomprehensible to the current generation. He wants to make out as if, you know, there's people that, they think a word means something, he calls it false friends, they think it means something, but in fact its meaning is different than what people assume today because of current usage. You see, that can easily be addressed in a few ways. One, you know, by education itself, but most importantly, uh, I want to say, is by the Holy Ghost himself, who is in fact the teacher and and is the, as it were, basis of truth. You have the Holy Ghost, the true interpreter, interpreting the holy words of God which are true. Um, this means that, that that Mark Ward is is not properly aligning with that but is in fact coming from an outside of that truth position in he's just naturalistically approaching this whole area and he has a naturalistic basis of reasoning going back into the past of how he's looking back um, which is a naturalistic and somewhat deistic view about how uh, we have truth as such, but it's it's in a kind of a, a corrupted form. So he doesn't have some sort of basis of theology or doctrine that says we can actually know truth today and actually access it and where it is. He's only got his own mind, and that's that's fallible. Two stars total. Here's how Vance states his thesis. The thesis of this seminal work is that the authorized version is no more archaic than daily newspapers, current magazines, and modern Bible versions. That okay, so this is a bit, I mean, this is one little quote from a whole book. Um, what he will do, what what I'm sure that, Mark, um, that Lawrence Vance does in his book is, he shows various difficult or unusual or whatever words that might be used in, you know, newspapers, magazines, and modern Bible translations but in itself that's that's somewhat of a of a uh, shaky kind of argument you see the truth is that 
the biblical words are specific and particular and like if there are unusual or difficult words being used today in the press or um, in common usage here and there they they like any words can be understood or learned or found to be uh, you know you find out what what their definitions are of course well um, the argument about the King James Bible in its peculiar language though isn't to do with um, that you just find out what it means which 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 is great that's what you should do but it's really about um, that it's not locked away from us but in fact those particular words were used because they are the actual English words that convey exactly what the originals were saying and so they're there because we are to understand precisely what was being said all along and we can't substitute words we can't say well we just have to update the language or keep it in line with the modern ever-changing you know modern world or whatever uh, that wouldn't do and if you turn to any authority you got the same problem the authority what I mean by that is if you turn to the Oxford English Dictionary well which Oxford English Dictionary are you going to turn to are you going to turn to the concise shorter or or the uh, compact full or full um, are you going to turn to what the, the first one or which then had supplements come out the second edition uh, came after that and the third edition and what more editions in the future I mean what which and where is the standard for English if you're going to use such a f you know flexible approaches about now translating or changing words in the Bible to meet the uh, you know contemporary way of, of using English we have to have an unchanging standard that goes forward in the future and that's exactly what the King James Bible is it's comprehensible it's yet able to be understood not only today but for the future and uh, is in this way an unchanging the words meanings are not changing the the uh, Bible itself is not changing into the future and that's that's a big point here and this is a point that or, or an area that Mark Ward cannot accept or cannot access into because of his his uh, human-based philosophical approach. It's page V I I I. Calling your own work seminal is gumption, and having a thesis like his, one that is so counterintuitive, actually I will argue counterfactual, is double gumption. I gotta hand it to him. I want first to interact with Vance's thesis as he stated it. Okay, so what he's talking about here is that if you rely on, say, the King James Bible itself being perfect, by a modernistic, with a lowercase m, standard, such as Mark Ward's approach, you would be, well, basically a fool or, you know, you're not in the realms of, of intellectual uh, rigor and propriety, apparently. Uh, yet this is God's method, but somehow well because it's it it seems foolish it must be rejected but and this is where mark ward will go ahead and uh, we won't see this part of the video but he's obviously going to go ahead and he's going to look in the oxford english dictionary and of course oh well this this word is defined as archaic um you know uh you know this this word whatever has different meanings or whatever has the bible changed meanings does it actually matter what the Oxford English Dictionary says about whether a word's archaic or not? As I said, if the word has current usage, if it can be revived, and that's the more important thing, Christian uh, religion going forward in power would bring up to date, that is, bring into the present uh, any King James Bible words and an understanding of them so that we would know, and even we want, to, we want it commonly known, what these words mean. Not as I say, not about you know people trying to emulate or speak King James Bible English today in their normal vocabulary. That's not what we're talking about. Uh, we're talking about using the King James Bible as the biblical standard of biblical English and coming to that as the authority and and people in their Christian walk, in their normal life's walks in the future, uh, indeed, uh, as Christianity increases, and as the power of God is at work, that there's more and more understanding. Not because someone like Mark Ward came and taught the people what 
the King James Bible difficult words really mean because he's doing it out of a wrong spirit. He's, he's doing it to mock or to counter or to, to present himself as an authority or, or to, to say, you know, if you believe the King James Bible is perfect, ha, 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 you know, that's, that's bad. Oh, but I love the King James Bible only. I love the King James Bible, but I just don't, you know, agree with King James Bible onlyism. That's what he'll say. But he's inconsistent with loving the King James Bible, that he has to go out of his way to make these remarks. He has to go out of his way to mock. He, of course, is uh, friendly with people on Facebook in group, uh, a group that would be attacking the King James Bible and yet pretending that they're, they're not really against the King James Bible, but just against those who, who uphold it. Um, you know, it, it's very inconsistent. If, if he really loved the King James Bible, then it wouldn't really matter uh, uh, to some degree about people who have a view about that they also love the King James Bible. Um, but apparently, no, there's, there's a way you have to love the King James Bible, and that's, uh, you in fact, have to not love it. You have to be critical and have to mock it and have to be against those who uphold its, perfect, its perfection and that it is perfect. Let's keep going with the video. We won't go the whole way through the video, of course. We're just going through a small portion to do a review. Clarifying what archaic language is, then I want to look at 10 randomly chosen examples from his book that will demonstrate the book's gloriously infamous gumption. There are tons of debates in the world. They never stop, and they never will stop until the eschaton. Okay, so I just want to address this point here. We're not going to go through the whole video, but uh, this idea that uh, there's debates or there's differences among Christians in the world. And he says that, that it won't even stop till what he calls the eschaton. But then he goes ahead and says that he believes that even, you know, in the future, there'll be these debates. This is a complete misunderstanding of Christianity and a complete misunderstanding of the work of the Spirit of God. What he's really saying is, we can't come to decide what is truth, and yet he's telling us what he thinks is right and to love the King James Bible only, or well, that's wrong. Apparently that's wrong, um, you know, but then, well, there's always conflicts. Let's just keep going for a moment because we want to see what he says next, which is actually um, borderline a heretical statement. And perhaps even then we'll have debating societies. Finite people just can't know exhaustive truth about everything. This is really an incorrect statement. He's saying that in the future, in the millennial reign of Christ or in the future, you know, they'll be still debating and carrying on, apparently. This is not right. This is not consistent with what the Bible teaches. This is not consistent with biblical doctrine. Further than that, he also makes out as if, well, because men are finite, we can't know. Well, by that logic, anyone who has that very view could themselves be wrong. Maybe Mark Ward is wrong altogether in his attack and rejection of the perfection of the King James Bible. Maybe he indeed is just as fallible and just as uh, misguided in that view. You see, that's more like it. This alone would lead to disagreements, even in an unfallen world. But then the fall of mankind kind of got mixed up in here, and now debates happen and go sour at 5G speeds. Many debates don't have an agreed upon standard. The standard is itself part of the debate. Max versus PCs, for example, it's meaningless to say that one is better than the other until you ask by what standard. Mac users tend to prefer the standard of aesthetic appeal, while Microsoft users might prefer the standard of lower cost or of available applications. They can't agree upon a standard of what counts as a good computer, so they can't have a debate over which computer is better, not until they establish a standard. Okay, so what we're going to find is that he's going to talk about, now he's going to define what the debates are over. Except the problem is he doesn't actually define correctly what the debates are over. You see, there is a view that when we look at the uh, original, what was originally written in the scripture, that either we know or don't know what that was, and in reality, of course, no one can see what the autographs of scripture was. Um, so there is a debate on well, which version or which set of words or which critical text is going to convey correctly um, what is right. And that's, of course, the modern versions versus the King James Bible debate as well. 
um, because the King James Bible view is actually that the King James Bible itself is an exemplar, a textual correct version of and matching exactly what was written in, in the original language. This is where Mark Ward misses out on a whole point here because there's a second massive area of of uh, debate and that is what is a correct translation? Can we put into English conceptually what is correctly uh, being conveyed or was conveyed in the original? In other words, what was conveyed to the original audience can that be conveyed to today's audience in English? Well, the answer for a King James Bible believer is yes. This touches mainly on translation, but also comes into the area of interpretation. And that in itself is a whole argument and a whole point. Further than that, and, and I guess this is the more important um, aspect about what we're talking about, I've written a book called Glistering Truths, um, in which I do talk about the Oxford English Dictionary, but Mark Ward is clearly ignorant on that point. Um, but anyway, in this book, Glistering Truths, and in other materials on my Bible Protector website, I definitely point out to this, this idea and concept that the King James Bible is correct to the very word, the capital letter, the punctuation, the word order. It's exactly correct, precisely so. And it is conveying completely in English for the world, for the future, what was being communicated in the original language to the original audience. In other words, we have everything today. We have the very precise wording, lettering, and and to know the meaning of that we have that available to us today we also have the way to to understand that as such and to interpret scripture and and what goes with understanding that by having the holy ghost today uh, the holy ghost apparently has no role in mark ward's uh, you know textual criticism or his translation or his interpretation methodology in a practical sense um so anyway, then he'll talk about this other area of where there's a debate. But let's have a look uh, now at, at the, these things. There are two major debates over the King James Version, and by what standard is a question relevant to each of them. One of the debates is Greek New Testament textual criticism. Which edition is closest to the originals? Remember that actually the King James Bible position is that the English it's not about Greek, that the English we have is the final received form, but let's keep going. The originals are the agreed upon standard, but we don't have the originals. Well, the agreed upon standard is not something that we don't have. The agreed upon standard is something that does exist, which is that there is a perfect word of God, and today we can see that the King James Bible conveys that exactly and accurately. It's not just a theoretical view, oh yes, we all believe that what was written in the autographs was correct. See, this is the difference between lowercase m modernism and a believing pro King James Bible only view is that it's precisely about whether or not we have it today or not. That's the issue, not whether or not we believe that the autographs were perfect. We all believe that, but the standard is actually to do with has God promised and does he work through history and has he provided us that perfection. That's where the standard's at. Um, and of course he misses that point because he doesn't believe that God would or has promised or that he could do that even as far as, I mean, theoretically he probably thinks, oh, God could do that as such but has decided not to for whatever other reasons. Whatever these reasons are, we don't know. Um, but that's because it's unbelief that their position of rejecting having a perfect standard is precisely um, a willingness not to believe that that point. So that debate is interminable. This is one big reason why I don't talk much on my YouTube channel about this debate. Well, of course, it is entirely uh, able to be defined and entirely able to have a very set position. We believe that we have the, the uh, exact words of Scripture, that this is something that can absolutely be uh, resolved. Uh, the second point, which he doesn't at all go into, would be about which translation conveys accurately and exactly in English the meaning and message of the originals. He doesn't even go into that. Then he goes on to this other point, which he's going to talk about is, is uh, English word usage. We have an agreed-upon standard, but we don't have access to it. 
But there's a second major debate over the King James Version, and blessedly we have an agreed upon standard to guide us and to stand over the combatants and debaters as a referee. This debate is over the contemporary readability of the English of the King James. And the standard is the dictionary. This is an absolutely false um, way of portraying it. You see, the standard of understanding the scripture is not contemporary readability. Com contemporary readability is an invented method. It's just saying uh, how people use English or understand English right now is the standard. It is not a standard. It's complete. That is, that is not an authority. Um, what is an authority is God's usage, God's promise, God's provision. That that's a standard. And what we find is that if you go to biblical English, if you go to the King James Bible in English, which is in English, then you'll find that that in itself is a self-authenticating standard, but the dictionary is clearly, according to, um, I'm sure Mark Ward would 100% agree, is, you know, as I've already mentioned, but I can say this, the dictionary is made by men. There are many different dictionaries, by the way, but, but the Oxford English Dictionary is made by fallible men. In fact, by some unusual characters. Um, take a little bit further from that, uh, which edition? What is the standard of English? You see, is it the first edition, the second edition, the third edition? Which edition of the Oxford English Dictionary? Of course, we would assume in the full Oxford English Dictionary, not in the shorter or the uh, concise. Okay, so having said all that, we find that we do not have an agreed standard at all. And in fact, this is part of a, a fabrication of a straw man argument, in fact, because or an argument based around a, a setting up a fallacious standard uh, because he will say well since the Oxford English Dictionary defines this word and that word as archaic or this is what this word or that word means uh, that's the way it should be no no the Oxford English Dictionary misses out on horrible amounts of information because it is precisely um, fallible and and uh, it is not like the Bible it's good, it's a very good tool, and indeed I've used it a lot, or to to somewhat degree, but the, the truth is, when you come to very particular kinds of things, let's say, for example, um, niecings, well, if you were to rely on the Oxford English Dictionary, yeah, you'd get a certain great understanding of that. But when you take the Bible in itself as the authority and define words uh, specifically biblically, that is, in the context of the King James Bible itself, you would find that you would see that the word niecings is not just some synonym for sneezing. And, you know, the, these ideas that, oh, well, that's just, that's just a spelling, whatever, from the uh, 17th century of, a, of what we now spell as sneezing or sneezings. But you find that niecings is, in fact, a very specific phenomena, which is not merely the word sneezings or sneeze, sneeze uh, because there is this precise accuracy and that's just one example of many kinds of examples of how the King James Bible actually is correct to its very um, very detail and uh, this is something that's entirely missing from Mark Ward's view so he's going to stand with his you know knitted uh, top his knitted jumper and tell us Oh yes, you know, like because he understands about English usage or something like that, but he is actually doing a deceptive work in doing that. Nothing about actually God's perfection and God's use of English, but everything to do with going to man's standard, saying, "Well, that is the standard." Why? Because Lawrence Vance, um, you know, as, as probably as honourable and good as what he was talking about, wasn't probably quite correct. But here, then, we have Mark Ward in finding some, you know, technicality or whatever, then goes off on, on a completely different basis because he wants to show that the King James Bible is not correct at all. That's his main thesis. Why? Because he is connecting to that spirit that is against the perfection. The spirit of error is precisely against the spirit of truth. The spirit of truth... 
um, has a manifestation or is in line with the King James Bible. That's what I'm saying. That's my position. Well, clearly Mark Ward is not of that position at all. He's of a very naturalistic position and he's looking at you know, the Bible as purely like uh, sort of a naturalistic phenomena and uh, the King James Bible I'm talking about specifically, he's looking at it just in naturalistic terms with his naturalistic tools, like just using the dictionary, like, oh, that's how we'll do it. Both sides acknowledge it. My King James Version only brothers acknowledge it every time they say, as I have heard them say to me repeatedly over three decades, anybody with a little diligence and a dictionary can read the King James Version just fine. People like me who love the King James but reject KJV onlyism, who argue that edification requires intelligibility, we acknowledge the authority of the dictionary too. I have <laughs> well, I pretty much said everything that would be able to refute that last statement that he said there. But most importantly, he has put stumbling blocks in the way to redefine what intelligibility is. And so um, instead of seeing that God is using the King James Bible with its perhaps unusual wording as compared to contemporary usage as being precise and accurate and in fact intelligible because it actually is intelligible why because the holy ghost is giving the insight comprehensibility and understanding um, but no no he doesn't want to have that he wants to have the natural measure of that and of course people will then say well you know it's hard to understand and this and that well of course it's hard to understand to the natural mind of course of course it's hard to understand. That's not how we define what, you know, scripture and its meaning. We don't say, well, um, I'll look to sinners and what basically the experience of sinners, it's, it's taking, um, it's, well, it's an enlightenment philosophy to take um, empirical information and then apply that to scripture. Oh, well, I see this, therefore the scripture is wrong. I see this, therefore my doctrine must be according to that this way and not according to biblical promises. See, there's biblical promises about having the Bible in a language known to the world, etc. All kinds of things completely will not be acknowledged by these anti-King James Bible-only people who, you know, falsely claim really to love the King James Bible. They don't really love the King James Bible. They probably don't mind it as far as, you know, they think it's okay, but they don't have a, a love for it. I have looked up every one of my false friends in the Oxford English Dictionary. So what he's talking about here is where he'll say, well, people don't understand uh, the words of the King James Bible properly. He calls them false friends, and he can look them up and then say, well, you see, you poor simpletons, you, you are misunderstanding. Why? Because he could even find that maybe some King James Bible using preachers were teaching whole things, but then what he's actually doing and this is where we find once again a deception is he won't just say oh look they they miss you know misunderstood a word or something or something like that but he's he's actually bringing in another thing because he'll then begin again to redefine the king james bible he won't accept uh, what the words are by themselves in the authority of scripture itself but using the dictionary can therefore and will inevitably be in some way prone to error in the sense that one the dictionary is not um, comprehensive on every last um, particular particularity of King James Bible terminology or wording or or um, grammar or or uh, you know punctuation whatever whatever and of course the Oxford English Dictionary in in particular here that we're talking about as with every dictionary, although the Oxford English Dictionary is the best, um, was made by men, and men are fallible, and probably um, in, in the large part we're talking about not born-again men. Um, so we can see very clearly that, you know, you're going to go to the world and to a, a essentially worldly standard to then define what the Bible means. I mean, that's like, in Bible times, would you, as a Christian, say, well, I want to hear what not what Paul is teaching I want to hear what the Pharisees are teaching because I want to go to that standard not to Paul's teachings well you wouldn't do that in Bible times in the New Testament and in the same way today why would we turn and say oh I want to hear what men have defined what words mean and as Mark Ward is aligning himself to 
and not what does the Bible itself uh, show and define and what is the Holy Ghost define and in line with that of course Holy Ghost or or uh, you know spiritual good teachers in line with that define the the truth the the words and their teaching and their meaning in a proper way in their propriety and this really becomes the major issue the OED and the footnotes in my little book authorized make this clear Lawrence M Vance acknowledges the same standard the dictionary in fact he uses the same dictionary, the OED, and he's the only King James only individual I've ever known who did so. Okay, so we'll conclude here. And we'll conclude here because clearly what Mark Ward needs to do is to get up to speed, because he clearly isn't up to speed, with the whole area of, for example, and he can look at my book, Listering Truths, he can look at a whole um, you know, variety of other information but he needs to get up to speed here because he's clearly implying, as as he's falsely doing, that King James Bible onlyism is somehow anti-intellectual and uh, bereft of of consistency. When in fact, what we actually find is that there is a biblical way of of reasoning. There is a biblical standard. There is an internal, inherently uh, correct, structured approach, um, which is fully uh, in in every every way, like it is fully able to be understood in a full breadth and depth, um, that we can have a full truth. That the whole argument about the King James Bible is in in every respect, from Bible prophecy to going then to internal um, internal measures to look at the grammar. You can look at the grammar on one point, or you can look at biblical promises about that we should have a perfect Bible today in the world. A whole range of, of things are there, and yet, of course, he's completely ignoring that, and he's going to say, well, I'm just going to talk about, you know, Ma, uh, Lawrence Vance, and, and that he was, well, he used the Oxford English Dictionary, and this is actually a deception in the sense that he's shifting now the authority to be the Oxford English Dictionary, um, which of course Lawrence Vance I don't think was I implying as such, but he he Mark Ward is is deceptively shifting it so that this will be the way of measuring, not biblical, not scripture, not not um, interpretation, but that we should use the dictionary. And as soon as you're on man's grounds or these grounds of of the modernists, of course, I mean they can't actually come to an objectively accurate truth but you can't either if you're going to go onto their grounds because there is no final authority there they'll just make it up and say well here's the dictionary we'll, we'll acknowledge that as the authority that's not the bible that's a dictionary anyway we'll leave it there <laughs>